So I'm going to be talking about the mystery of, of memory verse, which is a, a fairly old and often told story, but it's regained a lot of interest in recent years precisely because of the interest of that And I found that a lot of people who came to the field fairly new, fairly, uh, new to the field um, at the time of the light of discovery really didn't know the past history that makes it all a lot more interesting. I'm going to tell the tale from the very beginning. So first of all, a little bit of nomenclature. Um, so gamma rays uh, are the highest energy form of electromagnetic radiation, and I show this plot because um, how you talk about electromagnetic radiation depends on what wavelength you're interested in. So some people talk about frequency, and um, some talk about wavelength, and some talk about energy. If you're a gamma ray astronomer, you talk about energy. And uh, all you have to remember is that x-rays are a thousand times more energetic than visible light, and then gamma rays are another thousand times um, hundred to a thousand times more energetic than that, and, and upwards. And in fact, gamma rays cover a much larger portion of the electromagnetic spectrum than any other, than any other form of radiation. Um, but because they're the highest energy, um, and they're only detected when something unusual is going on, either a nuclear reaction, or um, some kind of emission from, from particles, electrons, positrons being accelerated in shocks or in magnetic fields, um, you don't immediately think of them when you look up at the when you look up at the night sky. But whenever you see them, you know something interesting is going on. So our, the story of gamma ray bursts begins in, in the 1960s and is actually an accidental discovery made possible because of uh, because of U.S. activities related to, to the Cold War. Um, so in 1963, uh, in, in that international um, diplomatic efforts resulted in a nuclear test ban treaty. And the U.S. military launched a series of satellites called the Vela satellites, which, would, which were launched into space in order to monitor for violations of this nuclear test ban treaty. And each of the Vela satellites carried X-ray and neutron and gamma ray detectors, and they were launched into space to see if, um, if the Soviets mainly were performing uh, nuclear tests either on the Earth or in space or even behind the moon. Um, and the gamma ray detectors were actually there just in case they were doing all these nefarious activities behind the moon because the gamma rays were the only things they could detect from the far side of the moon. So uh, gamma ray detectors are, are, are fairly simple um, and they have one major limitation. They don't have any mirrors, they don't focus the light anywhere, so all you know is that you've detected a gamma ray. So uh, you think of a typical gamma ray detector, a scintillator, is a light bucket for gamma rays. You know you've seen one, but you actually don't know where it came from. And throughout the 60s, uh, the, the, the Vela satellites became more and more sophisticated. There were actually um, six, uh, six pairs of Vela detectors, and by 1969, when, uh, when Vela 5 and 6 were, 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 uh, were active, um, they were much more sophisticated than the Vela 1 and 2 that were launched in the beginning, and they had accurate enough clocks um, and good enough timing resolution on board that they could tell a lot more information about the types of events that they were detecting on board. And what scientists noticed um, in, the in the data from Vela 5 and 6 is that an event in 1969, um, if you looked at the light travel time between uh, two pairs of satellites and you looked at the gamma ray signals that they had detected, um, they detected a, a short burst of gamma rays that couldn't have come from the Earth that couldn't have come from the moon, and that in fact seemed to come from just nowhere, it seemed to come from space. Um, and this is because the burst of gamma rays was shorter than the light travel time between the, between the two detectors. So using triangulation between the two detectors, they could uh, establish fairly coarsely the arrival direction of the gamma ray burst. So then they went back through their data and they said, hey, maybe we saw other things like this. You know, bursts of gamma rays and we have no idea what they are, but we know that they were not what you would expect from a nuclear explosion on Earth or in space or behind the moon. And this is the, this one I show here on the right hand side is the very first known gamma ray burst detected by, by Vela 3 and 4. And you can <coughs> see along the, along the y-axis I show the counts detected by a detector. Um, so this is just the number of counts per second. Along the x-axis it's time. So what you can see is that this is a burst of gamma rays that's very short, it just lasts about six seconds and has a fair amount of structure. And nobody anticipated this and nobody had any kind of explanation for them. But everyone was fascinated by them. Um, the scientists at Los Alamos who were looking at the data, of course, these are military satellites, they have public data, 
um, ended up spending six years looking at the data and publishing it in 1973 with uh, maybe a couple of dozen um, gang reverse, as they were called then, and saying, you know, we saw these, we have no idea what they are, they don't come from Earth, they don't come from the Moon, they come from somewhere out in space, what could they be? And this started the whole, um, the whole movement of, of gamma ray burst astronomy. Um, and it became very quickly an international effort, even though it started with US uh, satellites, it quickly became um, popular with, with the Japanese and with the French and with the Soviets. Um, and, uh, and several detectors were launched on other kinds of satellites, but with small gamma ray detectors in order, in order to pick up more of these events. Um, and in fact, it didn't just become uh, international, it became interplanetary because people quickly realized that the same effect that was used to establish that these bursts of gamma rays didn't come from Earth could be used to establish more precisely exactly where they came from. So if you put a gamma ray detector on a probe going to, going to Jupiter and a probe going to Venus and a probe um, going into solar orbit and you have some different in near Earth orbit, um, you can use this light travel time, and I show it geometrically on the left, to, to establish between pairs of satellites a ring using the timing of the gamma ray burst and the relative detection in the different, in, in the different satellites. You can establish a ring around which um, these uh, gamma ray bursts would have come from. And if you have two of these rings, then you get a very small point on the sky uh, from which the gamma ray burst must have come from. Uh, so, using that very, very painstaking technique of, um, of multiple detections on interplanetary probes, um, <coughs> several gamma ray bursts were fairly well localized. And all people could say is that they seem to be coming from somewhere, they happen at any time, they come from any direction, and we can't associate them with anything we know from our knowledge of astronomy. Um, they don't seem to come from the galactic center, they don't seem to come from the galactic plane, um, they have no idea what produces them. They seem to emit all of their energy in gamma rays because the X-ray detectors weren't detecting very much at all. And really, we have no idea what kind of sources could produce these or why. Um, but the most popular, the most popular models for gamma ray bursts always involve neutron stars um, because these things were felt like they're, you know, they're, they, they're, there's a lot of mass concentrated in a small, in, in a small. Um, in a small volume, and these things may have star quakes and may produce a lot of gamma ray radiation from star quakes. So most of the models revolved around that type of phenomenon. And it was felt that with a more sensitive detector, you'd soon be able to, to detect their concentration in the galactic plane or in the galactic center. So you'd soon be able to trace um, the fairly uh, well speculated distribution of neutron stars in our galaxy. The problem, of course, is that um, with small gamma ray detectors, you're only going to detect the brightest gamma ray bursts. So to detect more gamma ray bursts, you need something larger so you can see weaker, weaker bursts. But you can't really launch large gamma ray detectors on interplanetary probes. You're only really secondary payload. You can only launch something very small. So the next step was um, to devise a different way of detecting weaker gamma ray bursts and trying to localize them. Um, just on one satellite. And so the burst from transient source experiment for BATSI was launched on one of NASA's, uh, one of NASA's great observatories, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. You know Chandra and Hubble and Spitzer, which are still operational, but the fourth great observatory was Compton, the BATSI experiment, which was actually a series of eight, uh, eight very large detectors on, on the corner of the spacecraft. 2,000 square centimeters, so much, much larger, each detector, so much larger than anything else that had ever been launched. Um, and so the idea is that the large detectors would allow you to be more sensitive to weaker bursts, but by the large detectors having different orientations, you could also use the time profiles of the gamma ray bursts to reconstruct an approximate arrival direction for the gamma ray bursts. So instead of using the timing, you're using the relative rates in the detectors to say, and, the, and, and knowing the response of the detectors, which varies with the cosine of the angle to the source, um, you can say approximately to within maybe five degrees on the side, where the gamma ray burst must have come from. So the goal of BATSI, which was really, really kind of a minor payload on Compton, it was really launched for one reason, detect lots of bursts, and establish their, their distribution within the galaxy with the expectation that they would concentrate on the plane um, and also towards the galactic center. 
So um, before BATC uh, said anything about the distribution of gamma ray bursts, it solved one other problem. By detecting lots and lots of gamma ray bursts, um, it confirmed an observation made by Soviet satellites that gamma ray bursts seem to come in two varieties. If you plot their duration distribution, so this is the number of bursts on the y-axis and how long they last in gamma ray bursts along, in, in, in gamma rays along the x-axis, you can see that there are two humps, that about 20% of the bursts last less than two seconds and 80% last longer with a peak about 10 to, to 40 seconds. And so these two, these two bursts were called short and long, very imaginative, short bursts and long bursts. And it was not really known, you know, are they different sources or whatever, but we know there are short ones and long ones, and there were some slightly different properties in the gamma rays. Um, the, the energy spectrum keeps it higher energies for short ones and long ones, but that's really all that was known. The big discovery of that, of course, is that after nine years of operation and detecting over 2,700 gamma ray bursts, this is the distribution of locations in galactic coordinates um, of all the gamma ray bursts detected by BATSI. And you can see that they're completely isotropic. There's absolutely no concentration in the galactic plane, no concentration towards the galactic center. So this was a real head scratcher. And actually, this became very obvious just after a couple of years of operation. So after a couple of years of operation, the idea that you'd see a concentration in the plane had really gone out the window. And all the models, which had concentrated on gamma ray bursts coming from a, a, a population of galactic neutron stars, were in serious trouble. There were two ways to save them. So one of them was that, um, one, so I'll, I'll tell you the first one first, is that we're, we're, at, the, we're at the center of a, uh, of a very local population. So we're just not detecting far enough away to be able to see uh, the galactic plane or the galactic center. Just these sources are so local that we can't say anything about our offset. We can't see our offset from the galactic center. We're just detecting very local, very local population of bursters. But there's a very big problem with this. There just aren't enough things locally to make these gamma ray bursts unless they can do it more than once. And by more than once, it's on a time scale that bats we should be able to see bursts repeating from an individual source, and with absolutely no, um, no sign of repetition uh, within, within uh, the bats and gamma ray bursts population. But just based on the locations of the bursts, as crude as they were, there was no evidence for, for repetition. The other thing that you can do with, uh, with this sky map is you'll notice that there's a color coding, and the, the color coding is actually reflects the brightness of the gamma ray bursts as seen by that scene. So, um, so you can see that there's a fairly large dynamic range, meaning that you see from very faint to very bright. Now, if you're looking, if you're looking at any source in the sky, if it's ten times farther away, it's going to be a hundred times dimmer. But if your sources are distributed evenly in space, um, something ten times farther away will have a thousand times more sources just because it's a volumetric effect. So, um, so you, can, you, can, you can tell for an evenly distributed population of sources that your sources will be dimmer by the square root uh, of the distance, um, by the square of the distance, but they'll be a thousand times more. And the way you look at that uh, graphically is looking at their number brightness distribution. So on the y-axis, I show the number of sources above the brightness represented on, on the x-axis. So the way to read this is that if you're looking at an even distribution of gamma ray bursts uh, population, you expect, them to, you expect that plot to fall along the dotted line. And what you actually see when you plot the number of gamma ray bursts above a, above a given brightness seen by that suit is that you don't have enough weak points. So you'd expect to see many, many more weak gamma ray bursts and you just don't see them. So there are two possibilities. One, you're seeing the edge of the distribution. So you're seeing a population that doesn't remain constant as you look out. You're seeing the distribution, you're seeing the edge. There are no more beyond a certain amount and probably they peter out as you reach the edge. Uh, and the other possibility is that your, your sources, you may not be seeing the edge, but they're not distributed evenly in space. So for the first, for the first possibility, let's say you're seeing the edge of the distribution. And you're clinging to this idea of, of galactic neutron stars being the source of gamma ray bursts. One way to do this is to have a corona around 
the galaxy. And in that corona, you have a bunch of neutron stars that have been that have been born from supernova explosions, like neutron stars are, and they've inherited a kick velocity. And they've migrated outside the galaxy, and they're all lying in this corona. And so this solves your this solves your problem. You've got you've got you're at the center of distribution. You've got a corona around you, and you know, your your galactic neutron star model is solved. The problem with this is that as you get more and more bursts, you expect to be able to see. Um, our position in the galaxy offset from the center because the corona isn't exactly symmetrical around us, it's symmetric around the galactic center, and that wasn't seen. And the way to get around that is to push your corona further and further out so that our, 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 our offset from the galactic center doesn't seem significant, but the problem there is that you'd imagine Andromeda, our nearest neighbor, is exactly the same type of galaxy, and it too will have a corona of neutron stars, and eventually you should start to be able to see a concentration of gamma ray bursts from Andromeda, which wasn't seen. Mm -hmm. The other explanation um, for this plot is that your gamma ray burst population isn't evenly distributed in space because the gamma ray bursts are cosmological distances, and therefore when you're looking at the number um, brightness distribution, you're actually seeing them from, from parts of space where space-time is curved. So you're seeing cosmological effects because of the curvature of space-time, and you don't expect your burst population to be distributed according to the simple geometry I was talking about. At the first um, Compton Symposium, um, gamma ray bursts were just one topic. In 1991, um, everybody went to the meeting, and that was supposed to be a sideshow, and gamma ray bursts was supposed to be a solved problem, which is not what happened. So in 1993, um, the story is that they were kicked out of the Compton got too much attention. Um, it was before my time, and I prefer to think that it was such an interesting topic that it deserved its own meeting. But from 1993 onwards, in Huntsville, Alabama, which was the center of the BATS BAT team <coughs> at the National Space Flight Center, um, uh, it was held a, a, a gamma ray burst workshop for participants all around the world on past and, and, and current experiments um, to discuss observations and theories. The first one I went to was in 1993, the first one. Um, and I had no skin in the game because I was actually part of, I was a graduate student um, working on a ground-based gamma ray telescope um, in Arizona, hoping to see high energy counterparts of the gamma ray curve. So I didn't care where they came from, I just wanted it to come from somewhere for a <laughs> chance of seeing them. Um, so I feel like I'm a fairly objective observer of, of kind of the, the votes that were taken and the, the claims that were made at these meetings. And I would say that in 93, there was still a fair fraction of the audience. A vote was taken at the end of every meeting as to our gamma ray burst galactic or our gamma ray burst cosmological. In 93, there was still a fair, a fair amount of support for the galactic model. In 95, only the real diehards were clinging to their massive corona to 200 megaparsecs. And most people at really least switched over to the cosmological um, origin. But to finally answer the question through a debate um, on the 75th anniversary of the Shafi Curtis debate um, on the distance scale of the universe, um, the National Academy of Sciences um, supported that original debate in the, in the Baird Auditorium um, in the Smithsonian, uh, the Museum of Natural History. Um, on the 75th anniversary, uh, a meeting was sponsored between the two major proponents of galactic and, and cosmological um, origin of gamma rays: John Lamb from the University of Chicago for the galactic, and Woodham Pachinski for the cosmological. And, and you can see here the local connection. This is Bob Nemiroff, the professor here at George Mason, which was one of the sponsors of the debate. Sir Martin Rees was the moderator of the debate. Um, and Woodham Pachinski really he had great models. And the Batsy observations really supported this um, cosmological origin. But Don Lamb's point is that no, you still don't know where they come from. You know, surely if they come from something extragalactic, they have to be associated with some kind of source that you can see, some kind of galaxy. And all of the studies presented even in the 1995 Huntsville meetings showed no correlation with any known objects. And people had gone back to archival plates and looked for flashes and connection with gamma ray bursts, and nothing was found. Um, so even though the data suggested they came 
from somewhere else. There wasn't enough data to really conclusively prove that they did. And the neutron star models were still more appealing or less dramatic, less catastrophic than the cosmological model, which really required so much energy to be extracted that it was difficult to see how it could be done. Now, Bodan and, and Peter Mazar of Smart and Reese had come up with a hypothesis that if they are cosmological, this is a catastrophic event. And although all we see is this burst of gamma, ray, gamma rays lasting from less than a second to tens of seconds, this cosmological fireball, as they called it, as it, as it explodes and, 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 and expands into the surrounding medium, must surely leave an imprint. There must be some kind of afterglow radiation that we can detect. We just haven't been lucky enough to detect it so far. Um, and so that should be enough to convince Don that this kind of signature, a host galaxy or a detection of afterglow, should be enough to, to, to convince Don that, or the, or the Batsy, um, discovery of isotropy and incongenuity didn't. And so we enter the next, um, the next uh, age of gamma ray burst observations, and this was made possible by the Bethlesac satellite, which was a Dutch-Italian experiment. And the big breakthrough with Bethlesacs relative to other experiments to detect gamma ray bursts is that on board it carried a typical gamma ray detector for gamma ray bursts, but it also had a very wide um, X-ray camera, which wasn't very sensitive, but it was very broad field. So X-ray instruments are typically pointed, and you can only see a very small part of the sky, so that something that could happen at anywhere at any time is not very suitable as a, as a target for an X-ray telescope. But with its broad field, it would be scanning a large part of the sky and might be lucky enough to detect radiation from, from a gamma ray burst. And indeed, um, it detected several, uh, several gamma ray bursts in its field of view, but they looked just like normal gamma rays. They were over within a few seconds. But the position that the X-ray telescopes were able to get, argumented accuracy positions, were good enough to reorient other instruments on board, narrow field instruments on board, very sensitive X-ray telescopes, to the position of the gamma ray burst within hours of it happening. <clears throat> and on the right-hand side, I've shown you the very first afterglow um, measurement from a gamma ray burst, gamma ray burst 970228, um, which was seen four to eight hours, I can't remember exactly, after a gamma ray burst on the left, and then when they went back and looked three days later, it had faded a lot. So this showed that this new bright X-ray source faded and was probably associated with the gamma ray burst. So this is the first indication of afterglow radiation, long-lived afterglow radiation from this cosmological fireball um, expanding into the interstellar medium. Not only was it detected by the narrow field instrument on board, but scientists associated with the Sac satellite also found, um, also about time on the William Herschel telescope, and found that um, there was, a, 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 in addition to a fading X-ray source, there was a fading optical source. That's shown there as burst. Mm -hmm. And then Hubble subsequently went back and looked in the position um, of, of the burst and found the host galaxy that was very likely associated with the burst. So this this ushered in a completely new era. First of all, gamma ray bursts totally are cosmological. Um, and in this particular instance, they didn't um, measure a redshift for, for the next one that was observed in exactly the same way. They measured a redshift of 0.85 for this burst in 7508. So not only were gamma ray bursts cosmological, but you could measure the redshift either through the afterglow itself, if you got on it quickly enough, or through the host galaxy, or both, if you want to be convinced that the host galaxy really was the host of the gamma ray burst itself. This breakthrough was made possible by uh, the launch of NASA's SWIFT telescope in 2004. Um, this, this was revolutionary because where the narrow field instruments on Begosax took eight hours um, to make the observation of the X-ray afterglow, uh, the SWIFT telescope was built to, to slew automatically to the position of the burst. So the BAT um, detects a gamma ray burst and passes the position to the sensitive X-ray telescope, which slews within 30 seconds to the position of the burst, finds the fading afterglow to our second accuracy, passes the, the position down to the ground, and that position is followed up by, you know, by tens of telescopes on the ground um, with spectrographs and, and photometers to measure the afterglow and to measure the redshift 
of the galaxy and of, and of the Earth. And so this, this really, it allowed, although now we, by this time we already knew that births were cosmological, what Swift allowed us to do was um, to detect lots and lots of gamma births and therefore establish, you know, how cosmological are they, how far out can we see them. And what they found was they can be seen out very, very far indeed. Um, this plot is actually from about 10 years ago. But you can see this is the number, this is the number of births as a function of redshift of the births. So you can see very, uh, at the end here, redshift to 0.8, the age of the universe at the time of detection is shown at the, across the top. So you can see that the universe, at the time of detection of the most distant gamma was only 0.6 million years old. So this is, this is really, um, this is a, a very young universe when you're seeing these um, events, but they're so bright that while they're happening, they're the brightest explosion in the universe, you can see way back on the universe. Uh, still open. A still open question in memory bursts is um, whether the very first star, the population three stars, is actually capable of making um, gamma ray bursts. Um, so we really need something even more sensitive um, than SWIFT and um, something that can measure the redshift in, in, in infrared because, of course, it will be redshifted out of the optical band at those redshifts. Um, but uh, it's always been a race uh, between the farthest gamma ray bursts you can detect and the farthest quasar. Detect, and I'm not sure who's ahead at the moment, but they're fairly small numbers statistics. So what can produce um, so much energy that you can detect it so far away? The most uh, probable progenitor uh, is, a, is a massive star, so a star of 30 to 40 uh, solar masses, and that would go for a star in our you know, current universe. Uh, and as it collapses, <coughs> It shuts off its hydrogen envelope and produces these jets. And it collapses down into a black hole. The gamma ray bursts come from the jet. And after the star has collapsed, quite long after, it's going on a little longer than I expected, um, you expect to see a supernova. So this was really the model, this is the hypernova model. So you get a supernova, but before you can see the supernova, um, the jets uh, the gamma ray bursts are produced along the axis of the jets. The energy um, is either energy of, of particles in the jet interacting with magnetic fields or shocks in the jet, but anyway, the energy of the gamma ray burst is very collimated, and the energy of the supernova is much more obvious. So there's a lot of um, a lot of observational evidence to support this uh, to support this model. If you look at host galaxies associated with long gamma ray bursts, these are in lovely Hubble images. You find that Long gamma ray burst, um, long gamma ray burst host galaxies are, are fairly small, young galaxies, and the gamma ray burst comes very close to the center of light from star forming regions, just as you'd expect um, if they came from these tens of solar massive stars, which don't live very long. I mean, they all end in very, they have very short, very short, very bright lives, and they end in a violent explosion. Um, so, host galaxies are consistent with long gamma ray bursts coming from these collapse stars. <coughs> Um, and the, really the smoking gun is that um, for long gamma ray bursts that are nearby, near enough by to see a supernova, you always see a supernova. So this particular plot here, uh, the earliest, these are afterglow light curves from GRBO 303 or 329. Gamma ray bursts are known by when they happen. Um, at the top you see the earliest, uh, the earliest light curve, so this is just wavelength along the x-axis. Is, is very flat, very featureless, just like most um, most gamma ray bursts after glows in the optical. But as time uh, progresses, the the spectrum looks more and more like a supernova. And if you add all of those together, you can see it and then plot it over time. Um, you can see that there's a hump at about 10, peaking at 20 days, just as you'd expect for a supernova. Um, so smoking gun for the collapse model for long gamma ray bursts fact that they come from star forming regions and they have a supernova associated with them. For short gamma ray bursts, however, um, the hosts uh, are not young galaxies. They're old galaxies of any type. Um, they seem to come from older stellar populations. They never have a supernova associated with them, even though we only see them fairly nearby because they're not as bright in the gamma rays or in the optical. Um, the problem of short gamma ray bursts is, 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 is complicated because they're older stellar populations, and I'm showing here the most popular model for, for their production. 
um, is a set of, of merging neutron stars in a binary system. So they, ra they radiate gravitational wave um, energy, the orbit decays, um, they collapse into a black hole, or perhaps a neutron star, they produce a jet. And just like in the collapse star model, the jet is the thing that produces the gamma ray burst. But because they come from these, these stars in a binary system, these stars take about a billion years to merge and are formed with a kick that ejects them outside their galaxy. So it's really, really difficult to associate the short gamma ray burst with their galaxies. And you can really only do it probabilistically. You can say, well, you, know, you don't expect to see a galaxy of, of, of so close by in an error box so small, so probably by chance, so probably this is the galaxy associated with the short gamma ray burst. But there was no real smoking gun. It was really only a hypothesis that short gamma ray bursts, they don't come from collapsing stars, they come from merging neutron stars, they come from older stellar populations, um, and, and, and probably our best chance of confirming this is if we see the, if we see the merging neutron stars in some other way, which is where LIGO comes in. So in 2015, um, LIGO saw uh, the first observation of gravitational waves from a, from a pair of, of, of merging black holes. Now, we don't expect to see gamma ray bursts from black holes because black, merging black holes of stellar masses won't form an accretion disk and won't form a jet. So, um, but we were already ready for the LIGO era, so that when LIGO made this groundbreaking detection of gravitational wave radiation from merging black holes, we said it's only a matter of time before we detect emerging neutron star systems. They have to be more sensitive because the gravitational wave signal is much smaller um, from merging neutron stars, so they can't see as far out as they can uh, black holes, but we know they can do it, so we just have to. So the last episode on the gamma ray side um, in this story comes with the launch of the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. So this is the one I worked on before coming to headquarters. So it's launched in 2008 and has two instruments. The main instrument operates at high energy gamma rays, but the uh, lower energy instrument is a gamma ray burst monitor portion, which is what I worked on. Um, and it's much more like BATSI than like SWIFT. So it doesn't do great on the whole position of the sky thing. But it does really well at seeing large areas of sky. It's very good energy coverage, particularly in the energy regime for short gamma ray bursts spectrum. So it's very sensitive to short gamma ray bursts. It's used a lot of them, more than anybody else, 45 years here. And on the 17th of August in 2017, um, it's a Fermi soul, a really boring gamma ray burst. And I know it was boring because um, I woke up and I saw that our pipeline had um, <coughs> had floated on it. There was a data gap and the positions weren't sent out automatically. So I processed the data and I looked at the light curves and I thought, oh, better get this thing out now. And then suddenly I got an email, from, lots of us got an email from our LIGO colleagues saying, wake up! <laughs> <laughs> Um, and the text said, this short GRB is a short GRB, it has a friend. So this is, this is the friend. On the top you see the light curve of the gamma ray burst measured by Fermi, on the bottom is the LIGO signal, and that's the gamma ray burst. Let me show you that again, because I love it. <laughs> the sound effect is good. The sound effect is good. <laughs> so the bottom is called a chirp. The, the, merge, the gravitational wave signal from emerging, uh, from emerging anything is called a, a chirp. And this is the thing as it's spiraling. So you can imagine the neutron star spiraling in towards each other. They merge. And there's the jet. So this is conclusive evidence that short gamma ray bursts. Everybody else talks about the gold and all the other things that came from this from this event. But for me, this is you know, this is a 50-year mystery. It's exactly 50 years. It's a 50-year mystery solved with this very ordinary. I mean, this is such a boring short gamma ray burst. It's really difficult to tell you how boring it is compared to the exciting things we've seen. The the first thing is that we've solved the difference. We've solved the mystery. Where where do short gamma ray bursts come from? So they come from this merger of binary neutrons. Solve the mystery of the arrival of gamma ray bursts. But then you say, we can do so much physics with this because the, these neutron stars are merging towards each other. We know the time of the merger. We know when we see the gamma ray burst. We don't know exactly how the jets are launched, and we don't know exactly, you know, probably it's the jet launching time. 
So if you imagine, if you remember my graphic of the, the neutron stars merging towards each other, when they're spiraling inwards is when they're, when they're emitting most of the gravitational radiation. It's this final spiral as they form, as they form this either neutron star or black hole, probably a black hole. But when that happens, we still have to launch the jet. The jet has to be launched and travel through all the material around it um, before the gamma reverse production mechanism, whatever it is, whether it's partial acceleration um, in shocks or in magnetic field, there is a non-zero time associated with that. So we think that that is the delay, the 1.8 seconds, exactly 1.8 seconds. But then you say, what can you do with this? This 1.8 second delay, whatever, whatever it is due to, what we do with it is that we prove, again, that Einstein was yet again right. Because if you look at this, um, this 1.8 second delay, and you say, these things are 40 megaparsecs. <coughs> so so these are, this is a long way away that this merger happened. And these gravitational waves and these gamma rays race towards us. Over, over the universe, really. It's a fairly local universe for a gamma ray burst person, but if you imagine the gravitational waves and the gamma rays produced basically at the same time, they arrived here within 1.8 seconds. That tells you that the gamma rays and the gravitational, whatever they are, gravitons, whatever you measure gravity in, travel at exactly the same speed to within one part in one quadrillion. That's 10 to the so Einstein was right. Light travels at the same time regardless of wavelength, and light and gravity travel at exactly the same time. This is a really special result. It's really fundamental physics. So I'm going to, I'm going to finish with a couple of slides. So this is our merging system and our jet. And you can also see that this material that comes out, that's the gold. That's what was reported as the gold in the newspaper. So along with the jets being launched, you also have a lot of material being ejected. So the jets are produced along, an, the, the, the emission in the jets, such as the gamma ray burst, is produced along an axis. But you also have this fluff that's coming out, this ejector that's coming out, roughly, roughly the same in all directions. And from looking at that fluff, which so many telescopes, dozens of telescopes did for weeks, maybe months afterwards, you can tell something about the composition um, of the universe as contributed by these neutron star binaries. And so I'll end with um, uh, how, how do gamma reverse contribute to our knowledge of the universe? Apart from all the cool things I've told you, um, we filled in a little part of the periodic table that we didn't know um, where the material came from. So uh, we, know, we know what was produced in the Big Bang. Um, we know what's done. Uh, we know what's done with uh, nucleosynthesis and stars. You know you can't go above iron with fusion and stars. Um, we know what supernova can produce. Uh, so 1As, we know what 1Bs and 2s can produce, and now we know, and we also know that some of the heavy elements can be, can be produced by neutron capture from neutrons produced from the shells of dying low mass stars, but what we couldn't do before was produce what was, what's called the actinides. They can't be produced by any known process, and now we know that the merging neutron stars are probably responsible for all these elements that we find in, in the universe, including some of the gold. Um, and so we filled in a huge block just by the types of things that produce these unknown explosions detected by military satellites in the 60s. We, 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 can, we can say something from all the complementary observations about why our universe looks the way it does. And I'll end there. Thank you.